base of the Great Lakes, near the center of Lake Erie, a team of underwater adventurers, using the most sophisticated equipment, investigate another of the world's most famous shipwrecks. The sinking of the steamer Atlantic attracted international attention. In 1853, an obscure inventor, Laudner Phillips, brought a submarine to the site. Evidence suggests that the early sub was lost diving on Atlantic and never recovered. This submarine, in addition to the treasures of Atlantic, creates one of the richest maritime heritage sites in North America. Join the Sea Hunters as they search for what could be one of the world's oldest existing submarines, lost on the wreck site of an early immigrant ship, the Grand Paddle Wheel Steamer Atlantic. With over 100 million books in print, Clive Custler is the grand master of shipwreck tales and adventure. Director of the Vancouver Maritime Museum, James Delgado is one of the world's foremost marine archaeologists. With over 20 years wreck diving experience, Mike Fletcher is an internationally renowned professional diver. Leading the Econova dive team, John Davis has coordinated shipwreck searches around the globe. Together, they explore the planet's last frontier in search of true adventures, the famous shipwrecks. They are the Sea Hunters. <laughs> Intrigued by shipwrecks that have not had their stories fully told, Sea Hunters Clive Cussler, James Delgado, John Davis, and Mike Fletcher endeavor to explore a famous immigrant ship that went down in Lake Erie. Named for an ocean she would never see, she embodied the power, romance, and majesty of her name. Inspired by the spirit of the West, she emerged at a time in North American history when the road into the frontier was on the water. Born from the smoke and steam of the burgeoning industrial economy, she was struck down early in life. She sank, carrying down with her the story of that era. Lost were all the worldly possessions of her immigrant passengers, along with the gold shipment belonging to the American Express Company. Her tragic sinking became an international news story. As a result, her gold-laden wreck would attract some of the world's leading marine salvagers with their state-of-the-art equipment. More than a decade before the Confederate Civil War submarine Hunley would make its mark in history, a little-known inventor, Laudner Phillips, would bring his patented submarine to the wreck site of Atlantic. History suggests his vessel was lost at the wreck site and never recovered. If the Phillips submarine was found and could be raised, that would be almost equal to the Hunley as far as uh, historical significance. But based on the amount of evidence that I have, and it's not the greatest, but there, there is enough here, I think, to suggest that there's possibly a submarine lost on the site. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Does it warrant a search? Absolutely. It's just too important to ignore. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> oh, yeah. In fact, I mean, you can never do enough research. And you, you, you never have an X marks the spot, you know. Right. You just have to go out and try and do your best and, and hope you come close because Shipwrecks are never found where they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So true. And, uh, but no, I think if, if that submarine is there, it can be found. I, I hope it's not buried, because that, that, of course, makes the search more difficult. It'd be great if it could be found with a side scan. To search for the submarine, the team will voyage to the wreck site of the steamer Atlantic. Today, she remains one of the best-preserved side-wheeled steamers, giving us a glimpse back in time to the age of the western frontier when she served as a vital link in that great migration west. It was known as one of the last great migrations, at a time when territories existed west of the Mississippi River, and some of the boundary with Canada was still undefined. From the 1840s through the 1860s, a half a million people, lured by almost biblical promises of freedom and endless open farmland, trekked across the continent to settle the North American West. 
Many of the homesteaders were immigrants, drawn from Western Europe and Scandinavia. For these new North Americans, the migration brought them across the wide Atlantic Ocean to the ports of New York and Montreal. By either traveling up the St. Lawrence or ascending the Erie Canal, they headed for their first gathering place at the eastern end of Lake Erie, the bustling city of Buffalo, New York. From there, they would follow the Great Lakes water route to Detroit, and then on to Chicago or the Mississippi and St. Louis, the gateway to the west. From here, they would access the Missouri, which led to Independence, the stepping off point, where the water route ended and the overland route to the Pacific began, the Oregon Trail. The steamship Atlantic Story centers on that link of migration at the base of the Great Lakes in Buffalo, New York. She tragically sank in the center of Lake Erie, not far from the small town of Port Dover in Ontario, Canada. This story is very familiar to sea hunter Mike Fletcher, as Port Dover is his hometown. Uh, with the Nander Clipper, we're looking at about a two, two hour steam from Port Dover to the tip of Long Point. Here at Mike's house, they finalize their plans to arrive at the wreck site just off Long Point, a dreaded graveyard of shipwrecks. You can see why. You've got the conversion of all the traffic into the west on the Great Lakes. They came to Buffalo, that was the central spot. They had to steam west up. Lake Erie, and from there they could access the Mississippi, the wagon trains west. Heading for its home port of Detroit, Michigan, the steamer Atlantic was loaded with over 400 immigrants. She was part of a network of steamboats that transported immigrants along with the tools and provisions they would need in their new frontier homes in the west. Another side wheeler also lost and having much the same cargo was the proud steamboat Arabia. Lost in 1856 to the muddy waters of the Missouri River, the wreck site was quickly buried. Over time, the Missouri changed her course and left the wreck far from the river. After nearly a century and a half, the Arabia was found beneath 40 feet of silt and soil in the middle of a cornfield. With great care and incredible perseverance, the Hawley family of Kansas City unearthed the Arabia to reveal her treasures. The museum display that the Hawleys and their partners have created is the world's largest collection of pre-Civil War steamboat cargo known to exist, an incredible cross-section of artifacts revealing pioneer life, the seeds for gardens that were never planted, the hardware for homes that were never built, all of the items needed on the frontier from fine china to leather boots. Like the Arabia, the steamer Atlantic is a storehouse of pioneer life contained in her freight and the personal possessions of her immigrants. James Delgado will lead the archeological investigation. This is a wooden steamship built in 1848. Gold has just been discovered in California. The war with Mexico has just ended. Strife is already beginning to divide the country on the issue of slavery. James Polk is the president, and that's when the ship is built. And it's still looking pretty much like this on the bottom of Lake Erie 150 years later. Tomorrow, the team plans to dive the wreck and investigate its state of preservation. Mike, clearly when we get the side scan image, it's going to really help us with the dive plan. You're going to be able to direct me and John too around the wreck. You know, move forward the collision area. I don't know if it's going to show up in the in the side scan, but it, it will be here where the hogging arch meets on the uh, port side. Uh, yeah, you're going to be able to look at a side scan image and direct me around the wreck. Uh, let's get out there and go find this thing. I, I'm really looking forward to it. Yep. The next day, the team assembles dockside and are joined by Darren Keyes, a side scan expert and Dr. Joe Boyce, who will be responsible for the magnetometer. Bob Nadrovsky, a veteran captain, will pilot the Nadro Clipper. Bob has been sailing the Great Lakes all his life. His vast experience and boat handling ability will be of great help to the group. 
The community of Dover Mills was destroyed by fire by American forces during the War of 1812. Following the war, the town was rebuilt as Port Dover. Throughout its history, it has been known as a major Great Lakes fishing port, boasting for many years the largest freshwater fishing fleet in the world. No other community has a closer tie to the wreck of the Atlantic than the town of Port Dover. The Nadro Clipper, a converted Great Lakes fishing vessel, has worked exclusively as a dive boat, servicing the thriving offshore natural gas industry in Lake Erie. Mike Fletcher's professional diving career takes its roots from this offshore gas industry. He is glad to be back on his home waters on the Nadro Clipper, a vessel he knows so well. Anyway, long point to the Nadro Clipper. Clipper, Sue, long point, go ahead. Yes, yeah, the Nadro Clipper out of Port Dover. Uh, we're a dive vessel and uh, doing some survey work on uh, the south side of Long Point, about uh, two miles offshore. With her close proximity to Buffalo, Port Dover stood witness to the passing of hundreds of immigrants on what was then the watery highway to the west. Steamboating began in earnest on the Great Lakes soon after the arrival of the steamboats like Walk in the Water. As the public trust in steamboating increased, so did competition among the vessel owners. The boats quickly became larger, faster, and more luxurious. By 1849, the stage was set for the launch of the steamer Atlantic. 267 feet, or 81 meters long, and powered by a huge single-cylinder engine, turning massive twin paddle wheels. The Atlantic soon established herself as one of the fastest ships on the Great Lakes. This, combined with the events following her sinking, creates an incredible story. It was this story, retold in a book read by Mike Fletcher in public school, that sparked his curiosity. Despite local legend, no one could say with certainty where the Atlantic lay. As he grew older, the ship became his passion. He researched every archive from Chicago to New York City that held original information. Well, it's May 5th. Then in 1984, a lost fishing net and information from his friend Scott Bruley led to the final resting place of the Atlantic. Well, of course, the Atlantic was found in, in history. Its position was known in the early 1850s, uh, a shipment of gold being carried by the American Express Company was recovered. So what happened is over time, the exact position of the Atlantic was lost to history. But it was there, hidden in newspaper articles, court documents. And uh, by simply looking into the written history, I was able to create a, a pattern or a grid area that I knew it would be found within. And uh, it was actually a fisherman's hookup that fell inside the grid that led me to uh, relocating the site of the Atlantic. After a two-hour steam, the Nadro Clipper rounds Long Point and arrives at the wreck site of the Atlantic. Using the echo sounder and Mike's intimate knowledge of the site, a drop buoy is carefully placed just off the stern of the wreck. The buoy will act as a visual reference to ensure the survey equipment does not come in contact with the wreck. As the team planned the previous day, the first objective is to acquire a side scan image of the site. The side scan towfish is deployed 120 meters or 394 feet behind the boat. Like ultrasound, side scanning is a technique using sound to draw an exact picture. The towfish emits a sound signal at a very high frequency, 
The echo of that sound is recorded by the towfish and sent up the cable to the computer on board the survey vessel. The data is processed, giving an exact image of the lake bed or anything on it. Are both in the water? No, just the Titanic moment. After making a wide sweep, the Nedro Clipper approaches the Atlantic. Well, we're just uh, passing what would be the stern buoy. That's uh, marking the stern of the Atlantic. So we uh, should be running right now down the starboard side. So the image that you're about to see, as Darren marks it off on the side scan, will be the starboard side of the vessel. Yeah, I'm right here, Bob. Have a look for the flag up there. <laughs> okay, how far off are we, Darren? We're 35 meters off of uh, the line of the buoys. Gonna get it all on this, uh, this side. Yep, there it is. The survey system is working perfectly, and slowly, a detailed image of the site emerges. See the hogging arches? Yeah, look at them. They're great. Wow. Yeah, I can see it. Nice bend to it. Okay, there you can see the paddle wheel really clear. Oh yeah! Look oh, at the, look at the, yeah. look at the uh, spokes of the paddle wheel. Well, oh, that's crisp. You can see the arms. The acoustic record is a tantalizing glimpse of the ship sitting intact on the lake bed. The ghostly image is a shadow of what the Atlantic once was. On the moonlit evening of August 19, 1852, loaded with cargo and hundreds of immigrant passengers. The Atlantic steamed from Buffalo en route to Detroit. At some time just after midnight, Captain Petty handed command of his vessel over to the second mate after having just passed Long Point. Oblivious to what lay ahead, the long, narrow bow of the Atlantic sliced the calm waters of the lake. Meanwhile, bearing down out of the darkness, the propeller-driven freighter Ogdensburg spots Atlantic's lights in the distance. The Ogdensburg slows and reverses her engines uselessly as the Atlantic steams nearer, oblivious to the other ship's presence. Unbelievably, the Atlantic only spots the Ogdensburg at the last moment. His reaction comes far too late to avoid the obvious. The Ogdensburg bow cut deep into the forward quarter of Atlantic's port side. When the two ships came apart, they continued for a short while on their respective courses. The first mate, realizing that the Atlantic was in serious trouble, brought the ship about and headed for the shallow waters of Long Point. He knew his only hope was to run the Atlantic aground so she couldn't sink. Despite her desperate run, the water rose around the fires of Atlantic's boilers. With a great hiss of smoke and steam, the fires are drowned. The huge paddle wheels ground to a halt. Adrift and taking on water in the deepest part of Lake Erie, the Atlantic was doomed. John Davis prepares a side scan image in anticipation of the dive. Amazingly, Atlantic has stood the test of time. After 150 years on the bottom, one can easily see common features between an original drawing of Atlantic and the side scan image taken only moments ago. Mike will use an adaptation of traditional commercial diving equipment. Okay, I'm ready for the hat, Rick. His dive helmet is equipped with an umbilical that carries an air supply, communication wire, and a video signal. The video camera positioned on top of the helmet will allow the surface crew to see exactly what he sees. This equipment is an especially useful tool to the archaeologists who can converse with the diver 
and guide him throughout the wreck. The printout will provide the Sea Hunters archaeologist James Delgado with the most up-to-date condition of the wreck, providing a road map that will allow him to guide Mike around the site. On his back, Mike wears a bailout bottle, which becomes his emergency air supply, should his supply be severed from the surface. Okay, as soon as the boys are done here, I'll, uh, I'll jump in and away we go. Captain Bob positions the boat while Mike prepares to jump. There you go. All set, Dennis? All set, Mike. The helmet gear is by nature claustrophobic, but Mike is comfortable in this environment. He thinks of the panic and confusion suffered by the passengers of the Atlantic that fateful night in 1852. The jolt from the two ships colliding had thrown passengers out of their bunks. Most of them had run out onto the deck in their night clothes. To add to the confusion, many of the passengers couldn't speak English. Panic gripped the ship. Crazed with fear, passengers began jumping overboard. They threw anything that would float into the water to help those who were struggling. Husbands were separated from their wives, children from their parents. As a signal of distress, the Atlantic's huge brass bell was rung desperately. The lake became a mass of humanity, all struggling for survival. Upon hearing the bell, the Ogdensburg came about and raced to the Atlantic's assistance. In horror, they watched as the Atlantic's bow dropped and her stern rose in the air. And then, just as it appeared that the Atlantic would be swallowed by the lake, her bow touched bottom and a portion of her stern remained in the air. Eventually, the Ogdensburg would recover approximately 250 survivors. Unfortunately, many more may well have lived had they stayed with the ship. Despite the many dives Mike has made down to the wreck, each descent is a journey back in time. He will follow the dive line down to the ship which is only moments away. Passing 50 After hours of hanging nearly vertical in the water, the Atlantic gives up its struggle and succumbs to the lake. Down 49 meters, or 160 feet, the Atlantic rests in a desolate moonscape, floating in a sea of mud. You can see the foredeck. And uh, you can see as it curves around. Wow. The elaborate carving that adorns the stem of the ship is protected inside this iron cage. Exploring the wreck, we are transported to a time when the paddle wheel steamer was the fastest, most modern means of transportation in the world. Throughout the Atlantic's three deck levels and along her 81 meters or 260 feet, so much of this ship remains out of sight. Once alive with hopeful immigrants and the wealthy traveling rich, the main deck corridor now lies silent and empty. While the solid white oak hull of the Atlantic remains completely intact, 
much of her upper deck and cabins have collapsed onto themselves. Now this hull acts as a giant bowl, holding the fixtures, furnishings, and personal possessions once contained in cabins. What treasures and mysteries lie hidden here? The Atlantic's cargo, consisting of tools and supplies for the frontier, is packed into wooden crates and boxes. The workaday items that made a different new life a little easier, or perhaps ancient family heirlooms, a reminder of family home far away. They would be the tools and supplies for this new nation. It was a tremendous time of courage, of innocence, and new frontiers. A time when the ambition of the few would become the ambition of many, and their combined efforts would reach out and settle an expanding nation. An upper deck stairway leads to a corridor filled with mud and silt. Turning, Mike leads us back over the stern to the main deck corridor. Okay, Mike, um, I've got you dropping down along now. Uh, you're heading towards the stern? Roger that, Mike. I can see it here in the side scan as well. That should be port side. That's right, port side. And as I drop over the hurricane deck, you can see up inside there's a corridor. Roger that. Now, you've got overhead there. That's the uh, support for the deck? That's right. And it, from where I'm looking, I can see it underneath the hurricane deck. I see down the start port side. See how fine the silt is. Okay, Mike, can you estimate the depth of siltation? How much has it filled in? Jim, it's hard to tell exactly uh, how much is here compared to uh, the past, but uh, since 84 when I found the wreck. Sign of the wheel? Right here, it's going to be the steering wheel. Now, at one time, they were, they were dual steering wheels. They were upright when I first saw the Atlantic. I believe now that they were knocked over by this net. Hey, Mike, you're 21, two one minutes in. You've got about uh, eight minutes remaining. Roger that, Jim. Jim, if you look at the side scan, if you follow down the port side on the hogging arch, you'll see a line that runs forward to a big vertical mass. Not the mass of the ship, but part of this hogging arch structure. That's where we're headed right now. So you copy, you're going to go forward and you're going to move towards that alleged submarine. That's correct. Okay. Ascending on the chain. We've proven the question that this is simply a pontoon or a tank. You see it there, Jim? Yeah, I got it. Nice and clear. Okay, Mike, I think um, that's pretty good. Let's pop on out of there and let's head up. Um, I'm curious to see right over there by those paddle wheels. Okay, let's go up. Uh... This would be the center of the paddle box. Okay, Mike, uh, it's Dennis here. Uh, you're, you're coming up on 26 minutes. You need to make a decision uh, whether you want to go uh, come up at 30 or go for 35. Well, Dennis, if you're okay for it, I'd like to stay at 35 uh, bottom time. Roger that. Okay. We'll go outboard to the uh, to the paddle wheels. Roger that. You're going to go forward to the paddle wheel. Outboard, yeah, I want to go uh, up on the diver's slack. 
Coming up. The iron portion of the engine is deeply encrusted in zebra mussels. While these controversial creatures have given us this incredible improvement in water clarity, science debates the effect they will have on all bodies of fresh water. Beam engine there. Roger that. These timbers support this ship's massive walking beam engine that turned her paddle wheels. See the bearing there in front of me that the beam works on? And of course, the, the idea of the beam is it worked up and down on a, on a crank that turned the paddle wheels. You see the old lingcod? There's the cross timber that's broken down. So, I'll move forward. I'm gonna move quickly, like the diver. Looking out, we see the individual blades of the paddle wheel. Along the ship's side, enormous wooden support arms run parallel to the ship. There you can see them. There's a bucket. Very clearly, the uh, highest bucket on the starboard side. Yeah, Roger, I've got it right, right, right clear. Roger that. Now, did I see some of those arms broken, Mike? So we're actually looking at vertical pieces of the starboard paddle box. The spokes that support the paddles meet at a giant iron hub. Looking up, we see the enormity of the three-story high paddle wheels. Moving out, the bulwarks, the main deck staterooms, are complete except for broken windows, while the second deck cabins have fallen. A complete fisherman's trawl drapes over the stern. The once tall, prominent twin smokestacks have long since fallen and lie broken on the main deck. The question lingers, what is the future of this ship? Will the thousands of artifacts remain buried and not touched forever? Or will they be the objects of profit on the black market? Or is it possible they will become the centerpiece of museum displays, recovered through scientific process, the tools of education and storytelling? Okay, Mike, you are heading back to the downline, Roger. Roger, there's the round bar that leads to the starboard arch up on the slack. Ascending the 49 meters, or 160 feet, Mike must now make decompression stops in the water before entering the recompression chamber on board the Nadro Clipper. The use of this helmet gear on this dive has been very useful, but Mike is not the first diver to explore the wreck using a helmet. When the Atlantic went down, the American Express Company arrived at the scene. They were anxious to recover their strong box that contained $36,000 in cash and gold. When the divers learned of the depth of the wreck, they flatly refused to dive. The task fell to a local diver, Johnny Green. Johnny faced incredible challenges. His pumps had to be modified to increase the air pressure and his hose burst on several occasions. Groping in the dark, he had trouble locating the stateroom that contained the strong box. There was a constant worry of becoming entangled in the wreckage. Fearing for Johnny's life, the American Express Company called off the search, but Johnny persisted. In August of 1855, he went back on his own. Johnny felt that the gold shipment would be his to claim. On that dive, he sawed through the stateroom wall and pulled the safe out onto the Atlantic's deck and left it there on the corridor outside the cabin wall. Having just completed one of the longest and deepest dives in history, Johnny had no idea of the shock that his body was about to experience. I got you, Johnny. Elated that he had all but to secure the safe, Johnny Green returned to the surface for the heavy rigging necessary to recover his prize. He was soon struck with excruciating pain. Johnny had dove too deep and stayed too long. 
He was experiencing what divers know now as decompression sickness, or the bends. Paralyzed and near death, he was rushed to Port Dover. Almost 150 years later, Mike faces the same threat of decompression sickness that crippled Johnny Green in 1855. Technical advances in modern medicine have solved some of the problems that Johnny faced. Good job, Mike. Dennis Barrington readies the chamber. He will only have seven minutes from his last in-water decompression stop to secure himself inside the recompression chamber. You got comms there, Dennis? The recompression chamber has two separate locks and two-way communications. I just closed. Mike will breathe pure oxygen as Dennis quickly takes him down to 40 feet. Once stabilized, Mike simply needs to wait in the chamber 22 minutes before the risk of decompression sickness is eliminated. It took nearly a year of recuperation and waiting in constant pain before Johnny Green could return to the Atlantic. Still partially paralyzed from the bends, he dove to the wreck only to find his prize missing. He found out later that just days before his return to the Atlantic, Elliot Harrington, a diver from New York State, had recovered the coveted strongbox. Outraged, Johnny argued that all the difficult work had been done. Harrington only had to secure a line to the strongbox and then pull it to the surface. But Johnny's sad tale is not the only story of attempts to wrestle riches from Atlantic. In the 1870s, a group of investors from Cleveland, Ohio, lost a great deal of money with a grandiose plan to raise the entire wreck. What were those salvers after? The safe that had contained the $36,000 in American Express gold was recovered in 1856 by Harrington. Later, salvers were after what could have been a bigger bonanza, the passengers' possessions resting on the bottom of the lake packed in steamer trunks. It was believed that the Norwegians were carrying their life savings in gold. As far as anyone knows, that gold could still be down there. But the most curious visitor was the eccentric Laudner Phillips of Michigan City, Indiana. Laudner's patented submarine of 1852 was incredibly advanced for its time. He promoted his invention to the Navy and was told that their vessels sailed on the water, not under. The for the Darren Keyes goes over with John and Jim the preparation work he has done on his computer. Right here. What I did was I put in a one kilometer by one kilometer grid with this being in the center, which is supposed to be the Atlantic site, and we designed the survey grid such that the lines would run parallel to the wreck. What I think we do is start right uh, on the lines to the north here. The first offset line from there is 35 meters offset from the center line of the vessel of the Atlantic. Um, we start running that, that line and moving northward as we go. Right, well, Darren, this is great. Let's let's get those fish in the water. Let's see what we can find. Okay, I'll check with Bob, see if he's ready, and we can get the fish in and get great. started. Great. Thanks, Bob. Let's go. Can you have a broadcast? As the weather begins to change, 
The team deploy both the magnetometer and the side scan. The magnetometer is led out about 100 feet, or 31 meters, more than the side scan, so that if anything shows up on the side scan, the team can wait in anticipation for the magnetometer reading. Both the, uh, the magnetometer fish and the side scan fish are in the water, and uh, we're a third of a mile away, at going at almost three knots, so we're just about ready to get started in the search area. With everything ready, they steam ahead. It is only a matter of minutes before they reach the search area and the wreck of Atlantic. So what we've decided to do in looking for the sub is to, of course, circle around and work around the wreck of Atlantic, which you can see right here in the water. We've marked the bow and the stern. It's uh, very clearly delineated. It gives us a sense of where the ship is, one, so that obviously we can avoid it, but it also gives us a visual range and a bearing. To test their equipment, they plan to steam past the Atlantic. Just about still plotting it right now. And got the full bow. All looks fine. An anomaly in the shape of a submarine should show well. We're scanning around the wreck of the steamer Atlantic because it's most likely that it was the Atlantic's wreck site that this early sub was lost. According to the inventor of the sub's nephew, in his memoirs, there was a wreck in Lake Erie that in around 1853, they came out to find and to salvage. They took the sub out, they dropped it down to about 100 feet. The sub developed a leak. So they came up to the surface, got everybody out, ballasted it and put it back down without anybody in it to see what would happen and to test it. And at that point, there was a huge bubble of air that came up and the sub couldn't be raised. The ropes, of course, were rigged and set to raise it if it was full of air and full of water. They couldn't do it, and so it was lost. There are a couple of factors that argue for that being around here because this is an area where Lake Erie is just about at that depth. This is also a wreck that we know was being salvaged by this man around 1853. And so even though the newspaper accounts of the time don't say he lost his sub, it's very likely that this is the wreck and this is the, this is the area. We won't know for sure, though, until we get out there and survey the entire area with the instruments. Captain Bob's job at the helm is constant and takes all his concentration. Try and maintain, try and get that needle in the middle here. We're off 2.1 meters right now to the right of the course. Nothing on the side screen. Over the next few hours, it will be up to him to steer the Nadro clipper precisely along the grid lines as outlined on his computer screen. Yeah, we got something now. Yeah. In fact, we're seeing the same thing. We, we loop around it. Darren has plotted the course carefully, taking into account the speed of the towfish as it goes through the water. Lines along here. These numbers on here, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, those are event marks that they're, they're happening every 30 seconds and they correspond to the event marking on here. So if you see uh, an event mark on there and look back on, you can cross-reference it to the side scan record itself here and find out where exactly that is on, on the map you're looking at a minute ago on the computer. By the time they finish searching the entire grid, they will have a complete printout of the entire one kilometer square or 0.4 square mile section of lake bed. If there is a sub on the bottom, they are bound to find it. So this is the 500 kilohertz table that's open. We don't have the 100 open. And uh, the lines here are 15 meters. And of course, the sub itself is less than 40 feet. So the uh, what we're going to end up with is, if we're really lucky and have it sitting horizontally on the bottom, we're going to get an object that is less long than the distance between these parallel lines, uh, which is a small target. So if just, the, say, the tip of the submarine was sticking up the bottom, you could diffuse it with any one of these targets. Yes, you could, quite frankly, Mike. Yeah, any one of these, so one. any one of these issues could be, and that's why it's so important. 
as you know, to have the mag working in conjunction with the side scan, because the only delineation we're going to get, uh, if we're only getting a portion of the submarine visible, is that magnetometer hit, which is telling us that we've got some ferrous metal there. Using all of the technology and skill available to them, the team continues to search the grid throughout the day. Unfortunately, with every pass that takes them further from the wreck site, they realize the chances of locating the sub are decreased. This is the reality they face on every expedition, and they are reminded of Clive's comment that there is never an X that marks the spot. They accept the reality that in every hunt, there is an unpredictable element of success or failure. When all is said and done, an official call to the end of the search is needed. It is up to Darren, who is in charge of the side scan, to make his assessment. So it would indicate, although we did have some magnetic anomalies, that if there is something in this one kilometer by one kilometer grid, it's, it's most likely buried in sediment right now. But all is not lost. It's still possible that the sub is there. What they have learned is that it won't be easily found. They are hopeful that the sub is buried where it is protected from the elements and will live to be found another day. As the team heads for home, they decide to get one more side scan image of the great steamship. As they go by, the Atlantic reveals herself one last time. They are reminded of her significance and the treasures that still remain below her decks the story contained in the packing crates and steamer trucks, the personal possessions of the proud immigrants. As we leave the Atlantic to her silent resting place, we pay tribute to the museum piece that she is and remember the brave pioneers who died here, leaving behind for us to one day discover the hopes, dreams, and intentions of these courageous nation builders. We remember a wreck that is part of our history, the paddle wheel steamer Atlantic. Now it's your turn to get up off your couch and go into the deserts, go into the mountains, go into the rivers, the lakes and the seas, and search for history. You'll never have a more rewarding adventure. Join us again as we search the oceans of the world for lost and famous shipwrecks. Another true adventure with the Sea Hunters.